Hi folks, Dr. P here to try to dispel a myth. And that myth is that barbarians always come with fire and sword when they come into civilized areas. That's not true. We tend to think of it that way, and movies tend to show it that way. The barbarians destroying and pillaging as they went. And that happened sometimes, certainly, but frequently not. It depended on what kind of barbarians and what kind of defense, and on the familiarity of the barbarians with the civilized areas. Often barbarians mostly infiltrated in and gradually became part of the populace and sometimes displaced the populace, or at least merged with it. And of course there are exceptions to all generalizations, but I think I could generalize this way. The foot barbarians, the ones who come on foot, usually willing to settle in a new place, tended to be much less destructive than popularly thought, while the horse barbarians, who usually despised the settled way of life, and also who needed grasslands, were often very destructive. They were going to go back to their grasslands. They weren't going to stay where they were raiding. So let's consider the types of barbarians, both their origins and their familiarity with the civilized areas. Well, you have three general areas where barbarians come from. The steppe barbarians, usually Russia, Eastern Europe, and they're horse nomads generally when we get to historical times. Then we have the desert barbarians, which are near and Middle East and, and Egypt, and they are nomads generally. Then we have the forest barbarians who are settled, who farm who are usually much more numerous than the steppe and the desert barbarians because they're farmers. And that's obviously Germany. And then we have the peculiarity of the Goths who were forest barbarians and then moved and adopted steppe methods and then came into um, Europe proper and became settled again. Now what about familiarity? Well, the steppe and often the, the desert barbarians tend to despise weak civilized people. Whereas the f barbarians from just across the border, as the Germans and even if you want to call the Persians barbarians, want the benefits of civilization. Of course, the Persians had their own civilization, but they wanted more land and more dominance. So we can ask about the motivation of the barbarians? Are they raiding for wealth? Sometimes they want precious metal and gems, sometimes they want other possessions, sometimes they even want slaves to sell. But precious metal and gems are always the most portable. Do they have a need for food? That's a possibility in, in less common circumstances. Are they migrating and settling? Often that's because they need food or sometimes because they've been pushed by other barbarians. And all these things will affect how far they go and how willing they are to fight. To take Vikings as an example, they wanted land, wealth, and fame. But they rarely wanted to fight. Initially, they just wanted the goods, especially slaves. Later, though, they saw that they could get land. The defenders make a difference. In some cases, the defense is ready and some not. Occasionally there are great defensive works like Hadrian's Wall, Ova's Dyke, and the Great Wall, which was turf until very late in its existence. The photos you see of the Great Wall are something that only happened in the last few centuries. Those defensive works are more for discouraging cattle and horse raiding because defenders can't really man the wall. It's too long. But they can man the gates, and the gates are the only way to get the booty out or to get the horses in if the raiders rely on horses. Hence Ophus Dyke, a long huge pile of dirt between England and Wales, worked. But most times there's no great earthwork in the defense. Sometimes there's walls around cities, sometimes not. That depends on local history and ability to build, and it may be masonry or timber, and you even have hill forts, which are dirt primarily from an earlier era. 
There may be mobile defenders, whether on horse or foot, or they may be generally immobile. All this makes a difference. Maybe the defenders are somewhere else, as when the Germans crossed the Rhine in 406 to 407 AD. And of course, barbarians coming from across the sea give defenders different problems. At the extreme of defenseless, there's just farms and farmers who may survive or may not, depending on the barbarians. But think about it. If you're the barbarians and you kill the farmers, then the farmers can't produce more food to steal and more goods to steal. So maybe you'll let them live, even though some of them will then die of starvation. Terrain can make a different difference. Step barbarians did not want to settle in non-grassland areas. So the Mongols would not have conquered Europe for that reason alone, amongst other reasons. Any talk of the Mongols conquering Europe is poppycock. Whereas the North China Plain is a big grassland in effect, and so the barbarians were willing to go in there and stay. Desert barbarians often prefer less arid climates. Yes, they live in a desert, but it's not a nice place to live. Forest barbarians wanted farmland, whether they were coming by land or by sea. Whereas desert and steppe barbarians very rarely came by sea. And you get the anomaly again, uh, Goths, I believe it was, or maybe Gauls. In about 269 AD, they took to ships in the Black Sea and became sea raiders. That's quite rare. A lot of this is situational. When you come into enemy territory, if you're smart, you'll change your plans to match the situation. When monasteries in Christian era, and that's where the money was, get sacked several times, the raiders will go after something else because there's no money left, no wealth left in the monasteries. That has happened in Ireland, for example. When barbarians encounter little resistance over time, they may change from raiders to settlers like the Vikings. But frequently the barbarians gradually moved in, sometimes in conflict with civilization, sometimes not, perhaps even hired as mercenaries or recruited as federati as the Romans did it. Perhaps because the defense is scattered. The Anglo-Saxons may have come to Britain this way peacefully at times. The Amorites and the Arameans, among others, came this way in Mesopotamia. Yes, there were conflicts, but sometimes they just sort of worked their way in. And yet, some of these barbarians assimilated the residents and displaced the spoken language with their own, the Anglo-Saxons and the Amorites, for example. What about China? China was different. There were so many Chinese, and their civilization was so homogeneous, they always assimilated the barbarians, even though many barbarians conquered parts of China, or even all of it, as, for example, the Mongols and the Manchu. Chinese civilization rolled on, even when a capital was sacked by the Tibetans, for example. There are alternate views of this. One is that barbarian invasions are a reaction to the fall of empire, or the failure of empire. But I don't think this is the case, because typically barbarians come all through the life of a civilization. For example, with Rome, we had the Gauls, who sacked Rome a couple times. We have Marius's adversaries. We have Marcus Aurelius's enemies. And then much later, we had the barbarians who succeeded. The notion that its reaction to the fall doesn't exist, but perhaps you could say they only succeed after an empire falls. The Roman Empire suffered depopulation, which may have been plagues. We don't know what it was. China was vulnerable to barbarians when weak, and usually that weakness came with a reduction in population. So, fire and sword is more exciting, but it's not the only way, and often not the primary way, that the barbarians came into and stayed in civilized areas. Thanks for listening.